Welcome to Running. I'm Daisha Eaton. Thanks for joining us. We're talking with the Anchorage School District School Board candidates that you'll see on the upcoming municipal election ballot April 3rd. We'll be asking them about some of the critical issues facing the board and our schools in the coming months. We thought we'd ask you, the voters, to participate in this year's program. So my colleague Josh Edge captured a few of your questions for the candidates. I would just say that with as, as diverse as Alaska is with the student population, um, that our school board and our, our school system attempt to try something uh, a little more unique and uh, individualized than the rest of the country. Um, with the, Alaska being such an independent state, you know, we should show our independence on how we run our education program and not go along with how the Department of Education says we should do it. How do you plan on promoting learning while um, maintaining or improving fiscal efficiency? Um, how do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? Thanks to inflation and the increased cost of contracting and labor and flat state support, ASD is facing a $22 million budget shortfall this upcoming year. Now, budget shortfalls are common for school districts, but in the ASD, recent cuts have targeted students who need state support the most, people who require graduation coaches, summer school, and counselors. On your watch, if there is a budget shortfall, what standards will you use to evaluate which programs to keep and which programs to cut? I'm Daisha Eaton. Thanks for joining us as we talk with the candidates for Anchorage School Board. We've just heard from some voters about the things they'd like the school board candidates to talk about. In addition, we ask listeners of KSKA and visitors to our website, alaskapublic.org, to send us their questions. There are nearly 50,000 students that go to around 100 schools in the Anchorage School District. The district faces a number of challenges, critical decisions, and important issues. They range from how to get more parents involved in their children's education to finding the best district-wide curriculum. From how to address some critical budget issues such as funding summer schools and special projects like middle school career guides to how to support programs for Native students. The board will be learning to work with a new superintendent and continuing to develop strategies to meet federal requirements such as No Child Left Behind. We're going to explore those questions and more with our candidates for school board. There are six candidates running for three seats on the board. One is an incumbent. Each candidate will have an opportunity to give an opening statement, share their background and reason for running, and a closing statement. So now, let's meet the candidates. Our first candidate for seat E is David Knees. Welcome, Mr. Knees. Thank you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for school board. Okay, I'm running for school board because I'm a fiscal conservative. I think the school district is spending too much of the taxpayers' dollars. I'm also voting no against Bond 1, which is additional monies for school district. And why else are you running for school board? Um, I believe that the Anchorage School District has a lot of problems as far as management and how they're allocating their funds. I think that it, it's not getting into the classroom like it should. And you were a teacher for many years, correct? Yeah, I taught junior high math for 28 years um, and I also coached for the entire time I was in teaching. And what do you think you can bring to the board as a teacher specifically? I think that the uh, board has been without an educator's voice for a very long time. Uh, the last one we had on there was a principal from East High, Rita Holthouse. Um, the educator knows what you need to have in a classroom to teach kids. And one of the questions we received from voters comes from Ann Gore. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? Uh, you don't affect the classroom. That's the number one priority. It's what the parents have been asking. But every time we come to budget cuts, the first thing they cut are things that are in the classroom. So and away from the classroom. What specifically would you cut if you were on the school board? If I was on the school, if I was on, if I was elected to the school board, um, we basically get to vote a little bit on the budget this year because it gets presented to the assembly, so maybe not right away. Um, I'm totally against the SRO program. That's $3 million 
that hasn't haven't has never been tested to show whether or not it's effective. It was a free program when it came in. It's three million dollars now, and the board kept that this year instead of funding summer school, which is an effective educational piece. And briefly, what is that for viewers? Um, it started out as cops in school. It was response to Columbine in 1998, and it was a federal program. They stopped the federal funding in 2006. The board continued it, and now we have high school. In every high school, we have a police officer that's assigned, and it's a three million dollar a year annual bill. And what do you think is the school district's biggest success and biggest failure? Uh, the biggest success is probably the fact that we have a great crop of teachers and wonderful children. We have a lot of community support. They have really reached into their pocketbook and helped pay every time the school district was short on buildings and stuff. Biggest failure would be that we are not graduating the amount of children we do and we tend to um, only offer optional and charter schools to people that have vehicles that can get there. Now let's talk a little bit about that, neighborhood schools. Are, are they suffering because of the school choice program, the ability for parents to send their kids to charter or optional schools instead of the neighborhood school mm -hmm. if they think it's a better choice? Yeah, I, th I think what you what you end up doing, and there's, there's a lot of argument about this with like the voucher program and stuff, is when you have choice. I've always found that if a kid wants to be in school, they work harder, they do what they want. Um, you can't make a kid do something they don't want to do. So when you um, allow people to get stuck in a school, like an elementary school, and they can't go anywhere because both parents are working or something like that, you don't give them the full benefit of the wonderful programs we have in the ASD that are available. If you have somebody that has a car and can drive their kid to that program, all our charter programs are drive-to programs. And so you believe that there should be busing yeah, um, what ended up happening is uh, I looked at the Boston school model, and the Boston school model sec sec sectioned the city off into three zones, and you could attend any elementary school in that section of the city, and the um, school district provided transportation. They eliminated all transportation for junior and middle schools because they have a really good uh, public transport system, but any kid could go to any middle school or high school in Boston, and I think that's a real good model to look at. And what are your thoughts about going to the National Common Core Standards? Do you support that? Yeah, I was, I was at the, two of the mayor's uh, education summits, and I, I believe that that was kind of nice to see the board react instantly because the public was demanding it. I don't think they had much of an option to not go to it. It's a good first step. It's probably not the solution, but you have to, you have to say something. I, I, you have to have a measurable standard. And what do you think about the everyday math program? I know that's been a contentious issue. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk for half an hour. I've, I've hated it since it started. It was a top-down management decision. Um, prior to everyday math, the, the teachers got together, were given a selection of textbooks to choose from. We did it on a five-year cycle. And uh, that stopped, and we went 15 years without a new math book. And in that period, uh, the powers at, that be at Boniface Center chose a math program for us, implemented it, and we got stuck with it. And do you think the Common Core would solve that problem? Uh, what the Common Core addresses is what we've been saying is, okay, I'm a seventh grade math teacher. I think my kids should be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide whole numbers when they get to me. Um, when they're getting to me and they can't do that, but they know how to, uh, they, I'm teaching them geometry. They say, oh, we already did that, but they can't multiply. That, that's fixed in the Common Core. It says every third grader will know this, every fourth grader will know that, et cetera. And how would you characterize the future of schools in Anchorage? Um, I think Anchorage is in the process of evaluating what it wants to turn out. When I talk to business people, they're, they're very aware that of the shortcomings of the product that we turn out that aren't going to college. We have to de-emphasize the college track that we have set up in the ASD. Most of our children don't go on to college but we don't prepare them for the workplace either. And so are you for more technical training programs? Um, maybe. I, I like the old shop classes that we had when I was there. They pulled them out about the third year I was in, um, in the school district, and they got, got, got rid of shop, wood shop, metal shop, home ec, all that stuff. And then they turned around, and then this year's ponds are trying to put it back in because they modified all the space, so now it costs us money to put back in what should have been there to start with it didn't make any sense to pull it out. And with your years of teaching experience, how, how do those years inform your choices as a school board member? 
Well, you know, when you're looking at the school board, they set policy and then the superintendent is supposed to act upon it. So you have to lead when you're a teacher. You're the only one in the classroom with the kids. You're leading. You have to set the goals for the day. And I think that's a lot of really good practice. Um, our boards historically have deferred to the experts in the system because they have no experience with education other than being a student or perhaps a grandparent of a student or a mother or father of a student. And they're there because they're concerned, but they don't have any experience in how to teach kids. And one of your main criticisms of the incumbent for CDE, Kathleen Plunkett, is that she's shown, quote, illogical choices when it comes to cuts. She voted to cut summer school instead of eliminating $6 million of jobs from stimulus money, end quote. Why are you critical of that choice, and how would you have chosen differently? Um, the board two years ago, when she was a new school board member, um, Carol came to them and says, I've decided I'm going to take the stimulus funds. I'm going to accept $40 million the first year and $40 million the next year. I'm signing a daft David with all, my, all the other superintendents and stuff saying, everything we create will go away. Um, when they got to the, the cut this year, which was if you added $80 million and you cut 20, you really didn't go backwards that's a math problem. Um, the problem was this year nobody asked the question did we get rid of all that stuff we added? Not a single board member, uh, Ms. Plunkett, didn't ask a single request for information on the bu budget process. Not one. There was no comments during the budget. Um, she, she voted to eliminate summer school but then she tried to eliminate department heads which would have only got 10 percent of the money back into summer school. So it doesn't make sense. I mean you're a numbers person, do the numbers. And how about the importance of summer school? I know we're, we're looking at it being cut. Yeah. Um, it, summer school has been in the Anchorage School District pretty much the entire time I've been here. It's, it's very successful. You get kids in high school is a priority because you want to get those kids graduated. You want them to take care of credits they've missed. Junior high is the next priority, and then they go down to elementary. So um, not having it sets everybody back. And let's take a question now from David Morset. He sent this in via email. Are you happy with the current district transportation system? Uh, the current district transportation system is, is a break even. In other words, the state pretty much pays for it. Um, the, I do not like the uh, sole sourcing out of some of the buses because um, being a coach, I had to ride in a yellow school bus to Fairbanks four times uh, and I watched two of them break down. They're not built for 300 mile drives and I watch the teams coming down from Fairbanks and they're using motor coaches. Uh, the logic of it is that the motor coaches are not highway rated for transporting children. Uh, the other school districts do it, we don't, it doesn't make sense to me. So yeah, okay, I'd like to see a better public transportation system so we could do the junior high, high school model anywhere in the city thing. And you say the district has too much debt. What would you do to change that? Specifically, what would you cut? Uh, specifically, first thing out is SRO, second thing would be out would be full day kindergarten, um, and then you just go back through how it was added to the wagon. We have a big gypsy wagon of stuff, we're pulling up the hill, you go look at how long it's been there. They looked at music, music's been in the ASD for 50 years, it's been there since 1960, and it was one of the first items you're going to cut. No, you got the thing that got added two years ago. And do you favor some kind of revenue increases or tax hikes? Um, I think right now with the way the state is looking, it's got a budget surplus, but it's spending it as fast as it makes it. Um, I was here in the 80s when oil plunged, and when oil plunges, there is no spare money. I watched teachers get laid off, programs get laid off, uh, people left the state. Um, it's very difficult to keep asking for money all the time when people don't believe you're spending it where it's supposed to be going. And you think sports should be free. Yeah, well, that's my coach. And when I started in the Anchorage School District, all sports at all levels were free. You kept the kids busy. You knew where they were till 4.30 in the afternoon. What happens now is um, they pay. And it's like $125 to play a single sport in middle school. And it's uh, $175 to play a single sport in high school, plus what the sport asks of you. Um, the sports cost $16 million. It's a wonderful investment because you know where the kids are, you know they're supervised, you know they're active. Um, if you take it away as an opportunity, you, you have to hook the fish to play the fish. And for some children, sports is the fish. For some children, it's art. Some children, children it's music. You have to have those things because it's not books and learning for everybody. 
So why make sports free as opposed to arts and music? Uh, well, I think arts and music should be free too. Um, they charge a, a fee for renting instruments. Uh, they didn't charge that when I started. Um, they own the instruments. The district owns the instruments. They have them. Now, they're, what they're doing is saying, well, we have to pay for repairs and stuff like that. Well, yeah, if you've got a saxophone some kids use for 20 years, it probably needs some work. Um, every high school in its band and junior highs in its band room and orchestra room have instruments assigned to them. They come out of the school budget. I don't understand why you're renting out stuff you already own. And back to the trade-off, what would you get rid of to do something like well, that? Well, you know, uh, the music program, for instance, only costs a million dollars a year. Uh, the SRO program's $3 million. Uh, full, full day kindergarten, which ha again has no measurable benefit. When you look at it, you got to look at does it have a measurable ben benefit, um, is a $1.7 million a year savings if you went back to the half day or part time kindergarten we used to have. It, kindergarten's not even mandatory, it's optional. But we set it up like it's a required thing. And your closing statement, Mr. Nees. Okay. Um, I would hope that if you are looking at your school board candidates, that you research all your school board candidates. Pick the one that's saying what you believe in. If you're going to vote for bond one, Kathleen is your person. If you're going to vote against bond one, I'm your person. So take a look at my website and take a look at your candidates. Please go out and vote April 3rd. Thank you, Mr. Nees. And now we'll meet our second candidate, Kathleen Plunkett. Thank you. Um, and sorry, I'm under the weather. My name is Kathleen Plunkett, and I'm running for re-election to seat uh, E for the Anchorage School Board. I'm a lifelong Alaskan with uh, Matt Valley roots, and I've lived in Anchorage for about 45 years. I graduated from East High and UAA, and I've been an accountant and a very active community volunteer for more than 30 years. I believe in our public school system and I care about our kids. And let's go to a viewer question. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budget? Good question. It is a great question. How long do I have? <laughs> go right ahead. Take your oh, time. Oh, okay. Um, what, you, what you have to do is you have to look at the value of that particular program and the value-based budgeting has kind of helped us go through and evaluate the different programs and see which ones um, had more emphasis for our kids versus others. We, we've had to cut some programs already with our, our shrinking um, budget, um, but the value-based budgeting has helped us do that. And um, the more we can look at pulling costs out of other areas and putting them to the classroom is kind of the direction we've been going the last, uh, last couple years. The value-based budgeting really has helped us be able to do that. And can you explain that to people just a little bit more? How does the sure. value-based budgeting work? B basically what the value-based budgeting does is um, for all of the different areas, and, and I'll just take um, uh, middle school, for example, you know, they have different programs. You know, that you have your teachers. Obviously, teachers are number one. You have to have your teachers in your classroom. Then you have your different um, programs that you have within within the um, instructional unit and you work um, you work those those through and you you say does this have um, you, you assign it a, a value of, of importance to the instructional unit um, as well as how much the program costs for example the career guides were pulled out of this last year's budget but they were actually part of the stimulus and while they're they're a great program for our um, career and technical education, they were an extra that was not core to the classroom mission. Is that kind of? Mm -hmm. So it's an you. objective way to look at Correct. the programs as you cut. So what do you think is the biggest uh, success of the district and the biggest failure? The biggest, uh, I'll do the biggest failure first because I can just think of that one right off the top. Uh, and for me, I think that would be um, everyday math in terms of how it was um, implemented. Uh, it was implemented in like 1998, quite some time ago, well before I got on the board. And, and while I think it probably had the vetting that it needed, what it, what it didn't have was the professional development and all of the materials needed to really implement it with fidelity so our kids were able to learn 
the program. In addition to that, the parents didn't understand it, and I don't think they did anything to help the parents on that. I think some of the bigger success of, that we've had in the, in the school district has been in the career and technical education area where we're looking more at not just having just a King Career Center, but also seeing if we can't expand. And, and we have done this with our last bond and with this one coming up, going into the, um, into the different high schools for our different, our different programs. Um, the first year I was on the board, I worked with Cheryl Guyette with the Engineering Academy at um, Diamond quite a bit. And I've actually uh, kind of been on uh, that advisory board for, oh, about two years now, attending meetings as, as I could attend it. And several, we have several other great career academies. The one at Service on the Health Academy is, is, is wonderful. And they're looking at actually expanding the engineering um, to both South and Eagle River. And, and I think more programs like that that we can expand um, it gives relevant, 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 sorry, to to our kids that they can actually look at something, and and see a profession and actually see how it interacts with their with their life and and what they could do um, with their education. So you support Marvo Tech programs. I do. Let's talk about neighborhood schools. Okay. Uh, are they suffering because of school choice? You know, um, I love my neighborhood schools. Um, we have a lot of different programs, you're right. We have the, the, uh, the alternative um, schools, we have the, um, the charter schools, and, and then we have a lot of different um, lottery schools even within the regular school district. I, I think there still is um, parental support in the individual schools. As a, as a part of the 90 percent by 2020 United Way, which I've actually done quite a bit um, working in that program, I ended up um, kind of um, telling uh, the United Way folks that I would kind of t do a little bit more with just my neighborhood school. And um, I'll tell you that our principal for Wonder Park, the additional, you know, the neighborhood school that's closest to me, is we have some great principals, great staff, uh, great uh, great students, and and I think they're I think I still think they're doing okay. It's it's Title Twenty a Title, um, it's a Title One school, so it does get additional resources. I think where you have probably more issues are the ones that maybe have, you know, students that are struggling, that that aren't Title One, so you don't have quite as many resources. And do you support school choice? Um, in terms of all the cho choices that we have at our schools uh, now. Parents being able to choose to take their kids to a charter school or a different optional school. Um, I, I support all of the choice schools we have within our Anchorage, uh, Anchorage School District. Uh, I think there's waiting lists on, on most of them. A lot of them are the same parents on all of them. And, and parents, some parents make a choice that they'd rather be at their neighborhood school and work and volunteer in their neighborhood school, others um, choose choice. Regardless, it's parental involvement for me is getting the parents into all of our schools and they'll, I think they'll all do better if they have mentors. What about busing to school for people who choose those optional schools? Uh, I know a lot of parents would like to not be driving their kids to school in the morning. And, and for some people, they say, you know, driving your kid to school, if both parents are working, it's very difficult, if not impossible. Should there be busing to those charter or optional schools? It, it, would, nice to, it would be nice to say we could do it, but um, you have to look, as you, you had talked about earlier, our, our total population of, of dollars. And um, while in the legislature this year, they were talking about potentially some additional funding, in the transportation, and it's um, um, we don't. It doesn't fully fund itself. You know, transportation doesn't fully fund itself as, as it is. So it's it's one of those choices of what do you have to do to be able to get the most bang for your buck. And what can the district do to support neighborhood schools within the budget? 
The easiest thing for me, um, and this is where the school business partnership really has has been um, helpful, is to me is getting more mentors as well as inviting our parents and community members in into the schools. And, and that's a fairly reasonable cost. It's just a matter of saying, would you be able to do this? What are your thoughts on going to the Common Core Standards? Um, as you know, I was at the, the uh, press conference for that, and um, I'm in favor of it. Uh, the everyday math um, review that we did really kind of made me look at that, and, and while we put in some professional development and started that process through and we'll do everyday math in the fall, you need to have um, the programs that you can look at to adapt that and and that was really what kind of was outstanding to me and also the Mayor's Summit kind of brought it up as well but that we had some gaps we needed to work on. So you're happy with going to the Common Core Standards, you'd support that? I do. So since you brought up the Mayor's uh, Summit on uh -huh. Education, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So it, it, um, it came up with some, really with nothing new in, in terms of direction. And um, the more, to me, the more communication, and especially positive communication that you can have about our schools and about our kids, I think is always, always a positive. And what are your thoughts about the future of Anchorage Schools? How would you characterize that? I am uh, really hopeful with our new um, superintendent um, coming in that, um, that we'll be able to look at our, um, with our operational audit that's uh, with the Council of Great City Schools that's due out in June, that we'll be able to look at um, at, at how we're aligned and see where we can really make some positive change for our achievement of our kids and, and high achievement for our kids. And quite frankly, for me, I think that's what the Common Core tells our students is that whether you're looking at you know a career right out of high school or whether you're looking at uh, college, you still need a certain amount of high rigor, um, it's just like I didn't realize how much Algebra 2 was in some of the trade fields until I've talked to some of the different people. You still need a high rigor to be able to do well in life. And I think we have a, a positive um, outcome, but I'm a very positive person. As the only incumbent, what would you say is your biggest single achievement while serving on the school board? And what's your biggest disappointment with the board? The biggest achievement um, has been in the fiscal policy area, was, was trying to get a little bit more communication and, and set up some different funding um, mechanisms. Value-based budgeting is one of them. But the other one that to me is uh, just as important was the capital projects fund that we, um, that we set up. Um, it took about two years to, or not two years, about a year and a half to get it in the works. We set it up May of last year. It's only uh, seven million, but you know when you have a billion dollars of infrastructure, you need to set up a different process besides just bonding for how can you get work done. And I'm not talking, you know, just the normal maintenance because we have um, 22, 23, 24 million that we put into maintenance every year this is you know kind of to me is above and beyond that is 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 um, other type items that you really need to for for work on working that through the the piece I haven't gotten through yet with that that I would like is the piece for the um, getting the legislature and and I started this before I got on with the board because of the issues we had with bonding is whether you're you're bonding and you're asking for a debt reimbursement or cash or fund balance that the legislature would review it and look at at a matching um, a matching process, and um, probably how long everything takes 
to make change is the disappointment. Real quickly, quickly, let's talk about Mr. Needs. He's been very critical of you for what he calls illogical choices when it comes to cuts. He says you voted to cut summer school instead of eliminating six million dollars of jobs from stimulus money. Can you speak to that? His, his comment, and I, I try not to make negative comments about my opponent. That's kind of my two cents. But the summer school dollars that were cut came from stimulus funds which is which is kind of what he said we shouldn't have have changed i mean it, it's a fact of life it was a great a great um thing to do but quite frankly i'd rather spend our dollars on the core year and really push all of our kids to be able to improve every every year over summer school thank you ms plunkett now thank your closing you. statement thank you I think I've said most of my items, but um, uh, thank you for listening to me today. And I care about our kids. I care about this community. And I think my emphasis has been on fiscal policies and how we can use our resources more wisely for our kids, especially with our new superintendent coming in. It's a really critical, important time for us to be able to do this. And. I would appreciate your support and your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Plunkett. Our next candidate is Tam Magosti Giesler. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Thank you. I'm a uh, lifelong Alaskan. Our family came here in 1959 and a product of the Anchorage School District, uh, 12th grades, uh, graduated from West High School, and then uh, came back after college and became a teacher in the district for 22 years. Um, after I retired from the district, I became the director of the Anchorage School Business Partnership Program in order to bring the uh, community, especially the business industry, into the schools to help uh, improve our educational product. Um, I also am a parent of three Anchorage School District uh, students who have graduated, and my youngest is at East High School right now. And I serve, uh, I did serve on the Mayor's Advisory uh, Commission, the Budget Advisory Commission, looking at the school district budget for the last five years to learn quite a bit about uh, um, the accountability piece that I keep proposing. Uh, and finally, I serve as an adjunct professor at the University of Alaska in the MAT program, the Master of Arts of Teaching program to help train teachers who potentially will be hired in the ASD. So my life has been uh, passionately involved with education and I feel I have a contribution to make. Thank you. Let's go to a viewer question. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? Well, I think you have to look at what works um, the best, what provides relevance and rigor for students, particularly in the secondary level and then what uh, the uh, standardized scores will tell us some of the relevancy of some of the, uh, the basic math and language arts curriculum and what maybe needs to be tweaked. But I think you have to look at um, an overall product in terms of uh, not just test scores, but uh, what teachers and students and parents are saying, and then uh, use those as our top priority in, in moving forward. And what would you say is the school district's biggest success and biggest failure? Biggest success is a lot of the uh, career and technology education programs that are being touted these days. Um, I've been involved in them because of the business partnership program. Um, we've had for many years a construction uh, academy that's given uh, direct skills uh, and competencies to many students who graduated from high school and were immediately employed. Um, a few, about five years ago, Siemens Industries uh, contacted the district and wanted to do a partnership to start growing our own engineers. And Diamond High School has a very successful uh, engineering academy. Um, Service and Bartlett have come online with um, biomedical and or medical uh, career academies. And West High School, with um, some recent uh, CTE monies from the state, are planning what uh, they're going to be doing in the fall. There's also plans to potentially expand engineering academies. So that's a marvelous opportunity that again goes back to what I was talking about, relevance and rigor, that allows students to understand why they're learning something and how it's directly going to apply towards a career and uh, to just uh, test out th some, uh, some different uh, career pathways. I know my own son um, was interested in computers. He went over to the King Career Center and was involved in their computer science program. And the wonderful thing was because of tech prep agreements between 
the ASD and UAA, he ended up getting not just high school credits, but university credits simultaneously. And he is in that program right now at, at UAA and was able to save some money in his um, program. In terms of some of the worst things, I think um, the achievement gap is, is a very serious concern. And uh, you, you, you have these very strange dichotomies, like at West High School, where you have one of the highest national merit scholar, or the highest number of national merit scholars in the state of Alaska, but also a very high dropout rate. And you can tr uh, follow those um, situations, those strange dichotomies, all the way down into the elementary school where there's a big achievement gap. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed and, and dealt with now. Let's talk about neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. Are they suffering because of school choice, the ability for parents to send their kids to charter or optional schools? Well, no, because in some cases, those school choice are in the neighborhood schools. Uh, for instance, at Turnigan Elementary, where they have the Russian immersion, or Sand Lake, where they have the Japanese immersion, and Chugiak out in uh, Chugiak Elementary in the Eagle River Chugiak area has the Spanish immersion. There, uh, There's not one uh, area of town that has an exclusive hold on any of the options or the charter schools. They're spread around the community and that um, therefore it, it makes it uh, possible. On one case, there, there is an issue with transportation inequity. And uh, so if it's not in your neighborhood and you want to go to another uh, one of these charter schools, that is a problem. And it's something that I think uh, as a school district and a municipality, we need to sit down and figure out how do we deal with some of these transportation issues? Is it through expanded people mover system, um, a uh, increased funding for ASD to, to offer uh, equal transportation for all programs or what? But it's definitely something I want to look into on the board. So you believe busing is necessary? Yes, but I don't know if it's necessarily school busing. You have to have transportation available to uh, families in order to uh, be able to take uh, part in these choice opportunities. And what could the district be doing to support neighborhood schools more? Uh, you mean beyond uh, what they're already doing? Because they, they have numerous programs outreach to parents in the community, particularly in our Title I schools, where they have actual parent resource coordinators and are they also, they're also called family school services coordinators where they go out into the community and try to draw the parents in. And I know there's a number of uh, parent nights, uh, science nights, math nights, reading nights, and I'm aware of these because they're often using our business partners too to help um, staff these or in many cases our very generous business partners are providing dinner or, or some type of uh, refreshments to bring the families in. So I would, uh, you know, that's, that's the type of program I support and there needs to be more. We haven't met all of our needs yet. So in those cases, I, I think this is where the community can step up and be more engaged in terms of um, bringing the resources and attention to those schools that need more. What are your thoughts on going to the National Common Core Standards? Oh, I support it definitely, and it's one of the things I've been campaigning on. So I'm thrilled that the, uh, it is being uh, addressed with the Anchorage School District and the board even before I am elected. Are you happy to see the everyday math program look like it's heading out? Well, again, I have mixed feelings on that because um, I have talked to teachers who think it's wonderful, and I have talked to some parents uh, who feel that their child has flourished in it. On the other hand, I've heard from the other side of the coin, too. So I, uh, I think it's something that needs to be reviewed, uh, and definitely the public needs to be brought into the conversation and then a decision needs to be made. But I'm not ready to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater until a, a, a review is done. I do know some of the issues deal with the fact that it's a whole brain methodology that was intended to help students understand why are you learning this and what is it used for, which are obviously valuable concepts. But if they're missing the basic computation skills in that process, that's an issue. It's like not having your um, ABCs in order to read. So we need to find a balance. And in any case, in, in, in most programs, I don't think it's, it's either or. It usually tends to be a balance of, of more than one philosophy. So, How would you characterize the future of Anchorage schools? Um, we're about to go into, I think, a, a period of a lot of change. Um, just from the very fact that we have a new superintendent coming on, we have three new school board members, and we have uh, a retirement of a lot of the old guard last year and this year too. Um, plus, there are uh, increasingly, um, there are demands that are happening in our world as we're changing exponentially about the type of skills and the type of information that students need to know. 
one of our challenges is we're training students right now for jobs that haven't don't even exist yet because technology is is uh, changing our world so quickly so we need to focus on those things that will be useful regardless of the uh, job or the career that somebody chooses, critical thinking skills, um, what we call employability skills, how, how you work with people and uh, work effectively, and uh, you know numerous other skills. A very important, important piece, and this is a piece that our librarians um, will play, uh, already are playing and will play a continued um, role in, is helping students understand where information is, how to access it, and, and then how to critically evaluate it. Because as we know, everything you read on the internet is not necessarily accurate information. So, Let's talk about your work as Executive Director for the Anchorage School Business Partnership. You were there for almost six years? Yes, I'm, I'm still the director through the spring and then I'll be stepping down. But uh, it's been an exciting journey and one of the reasons I was tapped to be the ED is because of my in the trenches work. I, when I was a, a, at my last school at Central Middle School, I was the school business partnership coordinator and the teacher of a class. And we worked in tandem with our business partners to do a lot of service learning type projects. Um, at other schools, it, it tends to, uh, there's uh, another, mo another model where it's an entrepreneur entrepreneurial model and in other uh, schools it's a combination of service learning and entrepreneurial. Um, so I had the, the experience of understanding how the School Business Partnership Program can directly impact students in a positive way and give them all types of skills that will be needed um, re regardless of the career they choose. So when I came into the program I was dedicated to making sure that more schools um, built their partnership program and that they were quality partnerships, that it wasn't just a name on a paper, that they were ha truly having this interaction and that they were learning how to make it a two-way street because in any good relationship it has to be two ways. So it's not just what is the business organization doing for the school, but how can the school organization give back to the business. And so Why do you think that the relationship between the ASD schools and community business groups are, why do you think those are such important relationships? Well, because for, for, one, for, for one thing, from an employability standpoint, industry is going to inform us, in, particularly at the secondary level, as to is the curriculum accurate? Is this still um, the, the type of skills that are needed? from a standpoint of bringing the community in and all of their varied experiences and resources, we need that because schools are tasked with so many things that they were not in the past when I was a student. Um, so many kids are not coming to school prepared to learn. And so our business partners are, are taking on a piece of that whole puzzle that um, is immense these days because schools are asked to do so much. Teachers are asked to do so much in their role beyond the uh, cognitive, the academic needs of a student. So partners come in and, and, and do a piece of that, and they also bring a little a bit of legitimacy. I used to laugh as a teacher when I had my business partners in the classroom, and they would reiterate something that I had told my students, and they turned to me and they'd say, you weren't lying. And I'm like, of course I wasn't, <laughs> but now you're hearing it from the horse's mouth as to why these are the types of skills you need. And so they provide a lot of that support. And you've said you support an external audit mm -hmm. of the budget. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's necessary and what, would it, what well, kind of information would it give us? Exactly the type of information that we need to know is, everyone says the ASD is management heavy and that resources are not being um, properly uh, aligned or allotted to, to the need. And I think this will give us a true answer as to you know, are there too many uh, people in the in the head shed or in the administration building, or are they understaffed uh, in certain areas? And so I think you need to truly um, get some ac external um, opinions on that, and that's why using uh, a group like the Council of Great City Schools to bring in people that have worked in other districts of similar size and makeup that they can say, yes, this is where you're top heavy, this is where you're understaffed, this is where we recommend uh, a reallotment of resources. Um, because I don't know. Uh, you know, you, you can talk to people and they can justify their positions, but uh, I'd like to have an outside opinion too. And let's take one more question from mm -hmm. our viewers. Are you happy with the current district transportation system? In terms of the school bus system? Well, um, as I've mentioned to you, I don't think it's equitable for the uh, charter schools, uh, optional schools. And I would like to see 
more flexibility for those students who are working in or staying after school to participate in what we call third session or seventh and eighth uh, periods um, that aren't finishing their schooling until 5 or 5.30. And actually, that's another area School Business Partnership has worked on and, and currently um, we do have some cooperation with uh, the people mover system for getting kids home. But that, again, is not available for all students because if you live out in the, the, the uh, hillside area or in Girdwater Eagle River, those aren't necessarily options for you. So, yes. Thank you, Ms. Agostha mm -hmm. Giesler. Now your closing statement. Um, I am passionate about education. I've spent my life in the uh, either as an educator or being educated or working with people to bring them into the educational um, system. And I think I have a lot of skills that I can offer. And because of this knowledge, when I get on the board, I will uh, start running. I won't need a lot of time to, to learn the systems. I know a lot of the systems. And uh, so I would like to represent um, Anchorage on the school board, and I would appreciate your vote on April 3rd, seat F. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll meet our second candidate for seat F, Richard Wanda. Welcome, Mr. Wanda. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for school board. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Wanda, and uh, I actively involve community service for some time. And these are my letters from the congressional leaders in the, the White House. And I'm running for uh, Alaska Public Office since 2002. And according to city charter, a resident is uh, eligible and encouraged to run a uh, public office, such like a school board. And I'm running for the uh, school board simply for serving the communities. And why are you running for school board? What prompted you to do this? Well, th there's a vacancy. Uh, you know, today, this time, we have an open vacancy available. So, uh, so that, that's a reason I mainly choose the school board this time according to the city charter, okay. Thank you, Mr. Wanda. And now for some questions from our viewers. One of the questions we received from our viewers comes from Ann Gore. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? Shrinking budgets, th that's something up to the state and the federal. So uh, the state now is under the Republican, the GOP's conservatives. So the shrinking budget is the, you know, the, the true intention of the governor. So all of us, uh, 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 you know, under the, uh, the, the low level of the school board, it's uh, pretty difficult to, to amend that decision. And how would you prioritize different budget items? What would you get rid of and what would you keep if you had to choose? Well, we usually uh, recommend, you know, what, all we have to do is we can send a comments or recommendation to the upper level officials, like uh, legislatures, and to get rid of the negative uh, programs, get rid of uh, waste, and keep the uh, you know the, the effective programs, the good programs. Which programs specifically? Well, I think uh, um, uh, in the United States uh, we we should keep uh, mainly the uh, scientific programs available, because what we know. Uh, uh, the scientific uh, teachers, uh, you know, the United States input a lot of intelligence for so the immigration and naturalization purpose, and, and the mo most of them are the uh, science uh, teachers, like uh, mathematics. So you'd like to increase science and right, mathematics right. in the school yeah. system? Fo focus more on the science in America. And what would you cut if you were going to increase Some science? kind of waste, you know. See, uh, uh, See, we, see, if we have a double jeopardy, say we have, uh, uh, already have a geography or a geology, maybe they can combine one. But yeah, yeah, th that's, the, that's the point, okay? Just cut the waste and uh, cut the negative programs. And what do you think is the school district's biggest success and biggest failure over the years? Well, I think uh, in Alaska, the education is pretty successful, even though, you know, some kind of uh, negative figures but uh, I, I do know that Alaska is above the average. If you go down to, to the states and you see a lot of, uh, lot of uh, you know, states that don't even have, uh, you know, uh, mod you know integ I mean, a lo lot of classrooms do not even have the equipment available. So, so I think uh, Alaska education is 
truly above the average. So you think Alaska education is above average, but we do have not a great graduation rate. What would you do to increase graduation rates? Well, uh, I think uh, the, the punishment, uh, it, you know, we should use both the punishment and the reward, okay? And, and you know, a lot, lot of uh, reward, a lot of, uh, you know, scholarships and the kind of uh, incentives to encourage uh, students to graduate. What kind of incentives would S you use? Such as uh, like uh, job training, you know, job, job uh, pre uh, qualification, the kind of incentive, like, like even the money reward, and, and <laughs> such as scholarships or, or grants and to encourage students to graduate. But the, the kids, uh, it's not wise to punish them, you know, solely. So I, I emphasize, I do emphasize more uh, uh, rewards, okay? <laughs> And do you have children in the school district? No. And what prompted you to run for school board? Well, I, I told you, uh, we, this time we have an open vacancy available. That, that's the main reason I run the school board, under the city charter. And, and if there's a vacancy available in, in the assembly under the city charter, I'll run that. I would do that too. You know. And let's talk about neighborhood schools. Um, you know, there's a school choice program here, and some people say that the neighborhood schools are suffering because of school choice. Um, parents can choose to take their children elsewhere if they feel another school is better. Do you support the school choice program? Yeah, I, I think so, because uh, these professional uh, question is better to ask the, uh, the, the school officials in the Department of Education. And, and uh, you know, the board mainly, uh, they, they, they cast a vote for the kind of very small change every time, so uh, I, I encourage, uh, you know, the kind of uh, scientific question uh, to, to the school officials. And what about busing from the neighborhood schools? From, you, can get, you can get busing to go from your neighborhood to a different school in many cities. Here in Anchorage, you can't do that. You have to drive your child from your neighborhood to the other school. Do you think there should be busing to schools for children who are going to schools outside their neighborhoods? I have no idea about this point because Anchorage is a rather small city and uh, it will be more convenient to drive around instead of uh, the busing. But uh, either way, uh, th this question should be decided by the school officials, okay, not the board. The board is merely vote for the kind of change, okay? If you got to turn in the complete vote to me, then I I'm going to vote for, uh, you know, through, through the public opinions, you know, the polls, things that kind. So you think parents should drive their own children to schools? In Anchorage, I, I do encourage that way because the city is uh, rather small and, uh, and it's more convenient for the parents drive their kids, uh, you know, with safety and precaution, you know, uh, the, the care. And what are your thoughts about going to the National Common Core Standards? Do you support that? Well, that, that's too far for me because uh, I, I know th this this is uh, belong to the uh, education secretary and and his uh, high level officials. Well, actually, the board will vote on whether or not to adopt the National Common Core standards. Is that something that you would vote for if you were on the school uh, board? I haven't seen the detail yet, and uh, you know I, I need to take a look at the detail. Then I'm, I'm going to seeking opinion polls. Then I, I'm going to decide what to vote. And what do you think of the everyday math program? Well, I, 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 I do support this, this program because I know, I, I realize that American mathematics is uh, uh, somehow be behind the, you know, other uh, nations. So any, any points, any assistance to the math program will be encouraged. And how would you characterize the future of schools in Anchorage? Well, I, I wish I can, you know, improve school tremendously only if I'm elected this time. And if I'm not elected this time, and uh, everything will be cut off here. So uh, I do encourage voters, vote for the kind of uh, school officials who will truly and get the job done. And how many times have you run for school board? This is my second time. Second time? Second time. And the first time was in 04. And, um, how was your range of how how does your range of experiences 
your personal story, how does it prepare you to work on the board? Well, I, I at least have you know some kind of public uh, uh, office experience since zero two. So uh, if th this is an alternative, and then I think uh, you know uh, the voters need to choose a good alternative this time. And on your website, you say that your public service experience has prepared you to serve on the school board. How has that helped you, and what public service experience do you have? Well, the, the, the crucial point is the school board needs to cast a vote. That vote is very crucial and uh, heavyweight. So we need to vote for the right thing. And, and uh, so uh, these uh, public uh, officials have experience, and they usually consult the opinion pool and, and hear about what the people of Anchorage concern about and what they favor. And we're going to vote for their favors. And what about your experience, your life experience, your previous jobs? What kind of experience do you bring to the board? Uh, it, I, I haven't won any uh, uh, seats yet. So I, I, you know, I merely have, I merely prepare some public services, uh, but uh, you know, I haven't won any, any seat yet, so. And what's your regular job? Regular job? Well, uh, you know, uh, we, we do a lot of community service and, uh, and, and regular job is, is not public, uh, part of public service. That, that's how I got tons of letters from the White House and the congressional leaders. And you know, at that point, at, at, at these points, I'm pretty encouraged by national leaders. And um, are you happy with the current district transportation system? Yeah, I think so. So you think the busing system is just fine? Right, it is. As I say, uh, Anchorage is a very small city, and uh, it's unnecessary to have a school bus, you know, every time. But the parents uh, take the driving for their kids will be more convenient and cost saving approaches. Besides the fact that the job was open, what made you want to run for school board? Well, as I said before, uh, this time we have an open vacancy. Right, the so job's open, but what made you want to fill that vacancy? Because th there's, no other, uh, there's no other vacancy available. But uh, under the city charter, we are eligible to run any uh, seats, you know, if they're av available. Is there anything you'd like to change about the school district or the school board? No, no we, we merely, if we elected, we, we're going to uh, vote for, for, for people's voice. And when you say people's voice, what do you mean? Well, what, 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 what the majority of people are concerned, we're going to vote for, for them. And what do you think the majority of people are concerned about here in Anchorage? Well, as far as so the far, I haven't got any, <laughs> there's no uh, such uh, av uh, e evidence available this time. But uh, if any, any uh, bill, any uh, city code turn to the board, and we, we're going to vote for the people. And how would you find out what the people want? Would you do opinion polls? No, we're going to do a survey. Maybe I go you know, walk door to door, you know, ask people what they favor, what, what they disfavor, not favor, and things that kind. And uh, let's take a look at one of our questions from viewers. We have one here. What is your moral and ethical framework, and what do you use in your life to differentiate between right and wrong? Well, uh, as, as, a, as a public official, uh, there, there's no such thing right or wrong. And what we face is uh, the people's uh, approval, the pools. And say, if 70 people approve, an issue, and I, I do believe this is right, okay? If 30% uh, uh, disapprove some kind of issue, I believe this is right. But if 90% people oppose an uh, issue, uh, I will believe this is wrong. Thank you, Mr. Wanda. Now your closing statement. Okay. On April 3rd, I wish you elected your municipal leaders and who will do a better job for you for another three years. Thank you. Now we'll meet our first candidate for seat G, Natasha von Imhoff. Ms. von Imhoff, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for school board. 
Thank you, Daisha, for that introduction. My name is Natasha Von Imhoff, and I'm running for seat G for the Anchorage School District School Board. Uh, I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. I attended Chester Valley Elementary, Clark Junior High, and Bartlett High School. I left Anchorage and received a college degree and my master's in business. And I am back in Anchorage, married with my husband, Rudy, and I have two children, one age uh, nine, fourth grade at Bayshore, and a seventh grader at Mears. I have a business background, and I own and operate several businesses along with my husband. I am running for school board because I believe that education is the cornerstone of a successful community. I have a vested interest in the success of our community because I plan to live here, raise my children here, and retire here. And I feel that uh, I could offer quite a bit to the school board with my business background and a common sense approach. Thank, thanks, Ms. Von Imhoff. And now let's go to a question from one of our viewers. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? That is a good question. I ask myself that uh, often. Uh, with looking at the budget or looking at the programs at this point now, it's hard for me to actually pinpoint exactly which ones are uh, could be uh, placed higher on the list over others. I think that will take about a year to look at the entire district and analyze it. To offer a few ideas at this point, I know that there are a few social service programs that are also being offered by many of the nonprofits here in town. I think that that would be a good place to start to see if there's duplicity or if there's synergy where uh, certain programs um, could be uh, shared services with the nonprofits. And so let's talk about your background with nonprofits. You sit on a lot of nonprofit boards and one of your ideas is to bring the nonprofits in as a partner with the school district. Yes. How would you propose doing that and where would you start? Well, my background is uh, I serve on the Rasmussen Foundation Board and I've done so since 2005. I currently run the Atwood Foundation and I am also the program director for the Elieska Mighty Mites Ski Racing Program. Uh, that is very uh, uh, rewarding for me uh, with over 200 children competing. Um, how would I, so the question was how would I go about pairing those? Mm -hmm. uh, one example that comes to mind is uh, the Junior Youth Symphony versus the Anchorage Youth Symphony. The Junior Youth Symphony offers a symphonic uh, experience for junior high kids age 7th and 8th grade. The Anchorage Youth Symphony traditionally has been high school. Recently, it moved its age to also include junior high students. So now, a junior high student could have the um, choice of going with the Junior Youth Symphony, which is run by the Anchorage School District, or the Anchorage Youth Symphony, which is a privately nonprofit, privately run nonprofit with its own board and uh, a robust funding source. That would be. Uh, at uh, one area where synergy uh, could be um, could benefit. And what do you think is the school district's biggest success so far, and what are its biggest challenges? Uh, one thing that I have learned is that there's no one silver bullet. There's no one thing. There's many small things that, when you add them up, both good and bad, are equate to large things. Some of the successes. Um, I, uh, I happen to like the language immersion programs. Uh, my children attended Rokeschule. I think that really enhanced their learning. They were able to go to Germany and actually communicate and speak with others and, and learn a different culture. I think that's a success. I think the response to instruction, according to my uh, child, uh, fourth grade teacher, she said that's been a big help in her class and being able to pinpoint kids uh, trouble areas or challenge areas uh, early on and being able to address those. Um, some of the drawbacks, um, I think you have attendance, not, excuse me, the school district has attendance challenges. I'm not quite sure exactly how to uh, address that. Um, I think that's where the nonprofits may come in because then we can kind of search out why the attendance um, is lower than what we should, should expect and maybe there are a multiple of ways to address that. And how about failures, something you'd like to see done differently? Um, I think that there is a process in place right now to mentor teachers. I think that process isn't always followed at every school due to time constraints. Sometimes principals um, are intimidated by the process. Maybe the paperwork is copious and, um, again, time consuming. 
I think mentoring teachers and mentoring principals uh, is extremely important and valuable and probably could be one of the best bangs for our buck. I know in the business world, good companies mentor uh, top tier management in order to enhance the management team's performance. And I, I, while I said the, the processes are in place with the school district, I, um, I think that it's oftentimes school with school specific about whether those processes are followed to the extent that they should be. So you think that's one of the failures? They're not doing a good enough job? I think that it, there's room for improvement. And let's talk about neighborhood schools. Are they suffering because of school choice, the ability for parents to send their kids to charter or optional schools? There are several ar people who argue that yes, that transportation can be a challenge because if you can't, uh, you don't have the flexibility in your schedule or a vehicle or what have you to drive your child from across town to go to a school of your choice, it's a problem. Um, some cities, urban cities, have a more robust public system, bus system. Should the district be doing more to support neighborhood schools? When you say support neighborhood schools, in what way? Perhaps the busing, um, perhaps um, some people argue that we shouldn't be doing the busing, that the busing is taking students away from schools. And then you're left with a different population that can't afford to drive their children to school. There's pros and cons. I, obviously, if every school was operating at a high level of academic achievement, this would be less of, a, of an issue and less of a controversial issue. So ideally, we would like to make every school in the school district uh, operating at its high, highest level achievement-wise. And to me, that's where I would like to focus initially. And what are your thoughts about going to the National Common Core Standards? Do you support that? Yes, for the most part. Uh, I see that the, the positives are we will be able to share in data district by district, not just state by state. I think that the standards are slightly higher than the Alaska standards that we have now. I think that's a good thing. There will be curriculum developed uh, on a national level that the state doesn't necessarily have to um, spend the money to do that, as well as the, there is flexibility, is my understanding, that you can add on Alaska-specific, indigenous cultural-specific lessons um, to teach decimals, for, that, for example, or, or whatever the lesson may be. And I think that's a good thing. The, I understand the argument that some lawmakers are hesitant to jump on another bandwagon and incur additional expense. How would you characterize the future of schools in Anchorage? What we could be doing, uh, what we have the potential to do is wonderful things if all the stakeholders involved are willing to meet in the middle and give up a little to get a little. On your website you say you've been thinking about running for school board for the past two years. What got you so interested in running for school board and why did you take so long to plan this? I'll tell you. Uh, when my daughter uh, was going into the sixth grade, they had a math program called the Zero Hour Math Class, and she is a math whiz. It's her favorite subject, and they eliminated it right when she was going to take it, and I was very upset. She was upset. So when I called the school district, and I spent about four or five months talking with them, they would indicated to me that they would uh, reintroduce it as an online class, and I thought that was ridiculous for an 11-year-old uh, to take it online, particularly when the, they were going to have uh, two hours a week of instruction uh, for people, for, for kids who, who needed help, and I didn't think that was enough. Um, so I got, I started digging more and more in the school district and reading online and visiting other school districts, and I started amassing a very thick notebook and binder and collecting articles and getting more interested uh, in about what was going on in my school district. And so finally I called Carol Como and a, and a few of her staff and requested a meeting, which I presented, I spent three months presenting a, creating a uh, PowerPoint presentation, which was my viewpoint of the school district. And I presented it in the fall of 2010. And they were very gracious and allowed me to present the uh, material, but nothing ever came of it. And so I uh, felt that I had a lot more to say, and I waited until my family and my uh, business and my life was ready for me to take this next step, and that was this fall. And as you mentioned earlier, you're very involved in philanthropy across the state, and you know it well. What lessons have you learned about other districts that you could apply here? 
Uh, I visited the Harlem Children's Zone in New York City, and I met Jeffrey Canada, who started and runs the program. It's phenomenal. It is privately funded, for the most part, uh, some state funds, some federal funds, but it's mostly hedge fund managers and other foundations that provide the money. They do provide, um, they have a, three things. Time on task, which is they have an extended school day, oftentimes Saturday, and an extended school year because many of their kids that come into the program are well behind in math and they know they need the extra hours in the day and the week and in the year to get them caught up. Uh, the second thing is they start very early. I think they have something, a program called Baby Gem, and they start in second and th or, uh, two and three years old, and then they have a program for four-year-olds, and then they start them in kindergarten and five-year-olds. And, and they say they have great successes. They do door-to-door -door and meet with their families, and uh, they also provide some wraparound services, like um, theirs was asthma. That's been a prevalent problem in Harlem. They're very successful. They have one of the best um, exam rates and uh, student achievement rates in the nation. And do you think something like that could work here in Anchorage? If people are willing to give up a little to get a little, yes. Everyone's going to have to come into the middle. You can't do it all. you got to pick and choose. For example, the Harlem Children's Zone chose asthma. There is a diabetes problem in their area, but you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. So they've chosen asthma, and sometimes you have to make choices. And your website is covered with pictures of you and your family outside doing fun things. Um, how do you value PE and what, what role do, does PE and outdoor experiences play in a well-rounded education? When my children attended school in Germany, they had like an hour of PE every day. Uh, they also had knitting uh, in addition to math and other, uh, other subjects. Um, I think PE is absolutely critical for a variety of reasons, is a mental break, not to mention a physical break. Uh, when I have a tough problem, I go running or I go hiking. And generally my mind clears, and if I don't come up with a solution that day, I may come up with it later on. I think it's critical for a, a full mind and body health. And let's take a question from one of our listeners. What is your moral and ethical framework, and what do you use in your life to differentiate between right and wrong? Oh, tough one. Um, I, the, the three words that I live by are love, knowledge, and connection. And I've taken my entire life to choose those three words, and I live by them. I believe in showing tolerance and compassion I believe in constantly improving oneself with knowledge. That's why I went to business school. That's why I'm working so hard with the education system in Anchorage. That is my, that is my platform. And then connection is in sharing with others. Thank you, Ms. Von Imhoff. Now your closing statement. My closing statement. <clears throat> I am Natasha Von Imhoff. I am running for school board seat G. Uh, I will utilize my business background to bring a common sense and compassionate view to the school district, as well as fiscal accountability while trying to accommodate the best possible. I appreciate your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Now we'll meet our second candidate for seat G, Star Marset. Tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Well, uh, my name is Star Marset. I'm running for school board, seat G. I am a mom and a grandmother, and I've been involved in my children's education since day one. I've done everything from baking 55 pies in uh, two days, not one year, but four years. I've served on several PTA boards as president, vice president, that sort of thing. Currently, I serve on the, uh, or chair the Special Education Advisory Committee. I have been appointed to the Capital Investment Advisory Committee. We're responsible for the recommendation for the school bond and the six-year capital plan. And I'll be looking at serving on two other boards, which is to review the findings for everyday math and reviewing the educational specifications for the school district. And let's take a question from one of our viewers. How do you go about prioritizing programs in a time of shrinking budgets? Good question. Yes, it is a good question. And I think what you have to do is 
but one thing I think we've got to get more input from the teachers. I think we do a lot of things from the district level and we need to have our teachers more involved in these decisions because everything we do we have to look at how it impacts that student in the classroom. So we can look at a lot of things but bottom line is is it impacting the students in our classrooms. Neighborhood schools. Are they suffering because of school choice, the ability for parents to send their kids to charter or optional schools? I think in some cases, yes, may they're suffering, but what I think is we need to expand choices in our schools, not necessarily the voucher system, but we have some great alternative programs, some charter schools that we can expand in our existing schools, and I think we need to hold the school district accountable for bringing the uh, uh, core standards or making sure that our kids are getting the education that they deserve. And what do you think about the busing from the neighborhood schools idea? Right now, parents who want to take their kids to charter or optional schools have to drive them. So some people argue that limits a lot of parents. Do you think there should be busing, or is that something we can't afford right now? Um, I don't even know more from a logistics standpoint, I believe. My son attended uh, Mount Eliamna, and there are several kids. It's a special needs school. So they collect students from all over the district and they spend anywhere from two to two and a half hours on the bus going each way. I think parents would be a little more upset with the fact that their kids were on the bus for that long of a period of time and so until we can work out the logistics of something like that I think budget would be next. Should the district be doing more to support neighborhood schools? In what way? Uh, should they be providing that sort of busing? Do they need to finally decide on a curriculum? What kinds of things do you think they should be doing to support neighborhood schools? I think what they need to be doing to support neighborhood schools, if you've looked at the improvement plan that the school district approved for the second time, as you know, our achievement gaps and our scores, our achievement gaps between our Caucasians and our subgroups is just widening. It's not narrowing, which is very scary. We have a lot of kids right now that will not graduate. And if you look at the improvement plan, which I went and looked at last year's plan compared to this year's plan, it is pretty much the identical plan as last year. So I testified at the school board meeting with Carol. She was so impressed by my testimonial that she actually brought in department heads to speak to me about my concerns. And basically what I was told is that it's a two-year plan. Um, didn't really get good get good information as to how they were measuring the success, but if I look at the report card of what our neighborhood schools are getting, to me it's not working. So I think we've really got to take a look at the plan. I know they're relying a lot of um, hopes on this RTI response to instruction, which is something that is new. They spent 1.2 million on it so far, and we'll be implementing it in all of our schools next year. But uh, to me, I think we need to take a better look at our improvement plan because I don't think it's working. What are your thoughts about going to the Common Core standard? I, I think it's wonderful. Um, we do need to raise our standards for our students. It's going to create some challenges with some of our students because we've got that gap that's widening and now we're raising those standards. So more than ever, it's very important that we get on track with how we're going to bring these students up to um, acceptable levers, levels with their other peers. And how would you characterize the future of schools in Anchorage? Well, I think you're going to see more technology. Um, I'm hoping computers don't replace individuals altogether. Um, I think students still need that interaction. I worry a little bit about social skills just because there's so much Facebooking and uh, texting and that sort of thing. I, I really worry about our young people and them being able to um, exist in a social environment. So. Um, I see us moving forward. Um, I think we're looking at a good change for the school district right now. We're bringing in a superintendent from the outside, which um, there are concerns about. But I think it's always good to have new eyes look at something that everybody's been looking at for a long time. You mentioned on your website that you've been a substitute teacher. What kind of insights does that experience give you for your work in the school board? And how would you specifically change things if you were elected? Some of the things that I've seen in the school district, you know, one of the things we talk about uh, bringing down the class size. And what I can tell you in the school district, I've subbed in a class of 35 and the classes ran very well. I've subbed in a class of 20 and it was total chaos. Um, the other thing that I would look at is social promotion. Right now we socially promote our students that aren't 
passing, that they're failing to keep them uh, moving forward. They feel that it's a higher dropout rate if you hold them back. I think what we're doing is creating failures because you're promoting students that haven't gotten or grasped the fundamentals of education and now you're just moving them forward. On your website, you described your passion for children in schools. You've been a soccer mom, a cheerleading coach, PTA president. <laughs> How would um, having been a very involved parent uh, help you on your work with the school board? Well, I think the more you're in the school, the more you know what's going on. I think I have a very uh, real understanding of what's taking place in the classroom, what parents are facing, the challenges they're facing, as I'm one of those parents and facing those challenges. Um, I, with everything I've done and you know when we talk about PTA I mean I was actually just so the sports people will know um, MVP parent for the football booster club at North Pole High School so you know I've done a, a variety of things built uh, snack stands and press boxes with our club and that sort of thing so the more you're in the school the more you're involved the better understanding you have of what's going on and given your background in finance, how would you apply this experience to your work on the board? And what are the most pressing financial challenges for the board, in your opinion? I think that with the board right now, we need to do more outside management audits. We need to take a look at more of our processes. We've already taken a look at some of those and been able to streamline. I think we could look at a more of those type of operational um, items and maybe consolidate or look at other ways of cutting the budget beside teachers and, and programs that are working. Tell us about your work as a court-appointed special advocate. How's that work expanded your understanding of some of the special challenges that those students face? I was a CASA for nine years, started out in Fairbanks, and the understanding I have and the challenge I think these children that are in the state system in foster care is they don't have um, the advocates that they need in the school system. And so I think it's important that we take a look at those children because there are a large percentage of those children in our school systems. And we need to take a look at how they're being advocated for, uh, especially if they have special needs, and most of these children do have special needs in, in one form or another, um, FAS or, you know, uh, high function or uh, ADHD, those type of things just because of the environment that they come from. And a large percentage of those children are native. So we do have to take a closer look at how we're meeting the needs of those students. And how do you propose that the school board and the district can do more to meet their needs? Well, first of all, I think uh, the school board does have a program where they have surrogate. I've actually been a surrogate parent for the school board where you actually uh, attend the IEP meetings for special needs children that are in the state system and don't have a guardian at that time. Through those, the training for that is read this and sign it. Um, that's, I don't think that's good enough. So I think there needs to be more training for the individuals that are gonna be surrogate parents for these children. And then I also think there needs to be uh, more information passed on to the foster parents and to uh, other parents that would be, or guardians that would be representing these children. Because some of these have never had to deal with these, these type of issues before. And let's take a viewer question. Are you happy with the current district transportation system? For the most part, yes. Um, I, I don't have any complaints with it. I mean, I do have a special needs son, and I know that special needs children do have to go to the bus barn, wait there, and then the uh, school bus picks them up and takes them to their school. So that can be a little frustrating. But I think in the most part, our, our bus system works very well. What about alternative schools? Have they increased graduation rates? Um, a lot of people say they have. Uh, they cost more per student. Share your thoughts about alternative schools and explain the role that they should play. I think alternative schools play a very important role. We have uh, Highland Tech. Um, I mean, we have quite a few of the alternative schools. They give the parents and the student a choice of where their interests lie or how best they can meet their educational needs and the way the material is presented or just the environment of the school, where their interests are, that sort of thing. And anytime you engage a student and have them excited about learning or get them involved in something that they see relevance in, it's definitely going to improve their academic output and their graduation rate. More parental and guardian involvement. It's been a big issue. Um, the district has done a lot to increase mm -hmm. family involvement, parents, guardians, grandparents. What would you do to increase parental involvement? 
I think we have to go out to the different organizations. There are a lot of organizations out there. There's the Hmong Society that actually have a council or a group that they talk about their concerns. I think we've got to be more active in reaching out to them and getting them involved. I will tell you as uh, going into a parent-teacher conference that I had called, and especially when you get into middle school and high school, you have the different teachers, so you have about seven of them. So when you walk into a room and you've got seven seven um, teachers sitting there, that's already intimidating, especially for someone that maybe doesn't have a high school education and is not comfortable coming into the school. So based on just that type of environment, they're going to be hesitant and intimidated to put their issues and um, what they're concerned about up front. So I do think we have to do a better job of reaching out instead of the invitation to the parent is not working to get them into the school. We are working better on making it a more invi inviting atmosphere to come into, but we've got to do more about getting out into the community. The makeup of the Anchorage School District is increasingly diverse. More than half of the students are students of color. More than 6,000 students in the district qualify for English language learner services. How big a priority is funding for those types of programs? I think it's very important. Um, as a school district, our responsibility is to educate every child in the school district, regardless of whether they're English speaking or of a different culture or race or anything else. It, our goal is to educate every child and make sure that they have the same opportunity to an equal education. And let's go to another viewer question. What is your moral and ethical framework and what do you use in your life to differentiate between right and wrong? Well, I think my mother instilled that in me <laughs> as uh, most mothers or fathers probably do. Um, you know, if you are looking to make a decision and you don't know, there's like that little thing in the back of your mind that says, I'm not sure if this is right or not, then it's probably not. Um, always err on the side of caution and, you know, always treat people the way you want to be treated and be honest and fair. Thank you, Ms. Marset. Now your closing statement. Okay. Well, my name is Star Marsat and I'm running for school board seat G. I will tell you that I've gone back to school at age 40 while raising children, being a wife, working full time to finish my education, a BS in uh, business management. So I know the value of a good education. I definitely uh, value that. I'm also a hard worker as, as uh, we've talked about earlier. I've gone from a teller in the financial industry to a vice president. So I've worked hard all my life and I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and go to work for you. My name is Star Marset. I'm running for seat G and I appreciate your vote on April 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marset. In addition to electing members to the school board, voters will also have a chance to vote on a school bond proposal that's on the ballot as Proposition 1. Basically, it's a $59 million bond. It will pay for construction projects, including building improvements and renovation. Some of the construction would be of buildings that are meant to house vocational and technical programs. Some say those buildings are needed to prepare more students to work in skilled trades, an area with lots of high-paying in-state jobs. The state can reimburse the district for about two-thirds of the $59 million. If passed, it will raise property taxes for the owner of the average price home in Anchorage, that's $315,000, by around $20 a year. Anchorage Municipal Elections are coming up on April 3rd. Thanks to the Anchorage School Board candidates for participating, and thanks for joining us on Running. I'm Daisha Eaton.